I'm very glad uh, for the opportunity and the invitation to, to come here and present uh, some of the work that I've been doing. And uh, this is a very uh, uh, important occasion for me because it's an opportunity for me to, uh, to pay tribute to, to several people who have uh, played a very significant role in my life, in my career particularly. And uh, before I go uh, into that, I'm just going to introduce what I'm going to be discussing about. So I'll start with the, uh, the normal type of chronology or framework that we have in the, in the Tukana Basin. So I'll mostly be discussing about Pliocene and Pleistocene sequence. And then I'll talk about uh, petrology and what we can be able to do with petrology because that is the basis that I'm using for the method that I'll be discussing. So it's a type of um, uh, relative uh, dating method but if you use it very carefully, uh, together coupled with uh, uh, isotopic dates or paleomag and similar things, you can be able to come up with a very, very precise um, age estimate of, uh, of a site. So that's what I'll be discussing. And uh, many of these ideas, they come from some of the work that Frank Brown uh, started uh, uh, a while ago. And uh, part of the work that I've been doing is basically to continue with the legacy of the work that he did. So you'll be hearing me mention him uh, very many times as I, as I, during my discussion. So, and these are very, have been very important uh, people in my life. I met um, Richard Leakey uh, at the museum when I was working there as a volunteer. And he's actually, him and Dr. Miv Leakey, who uh, it gave me an opportunity to go to Trukana for the first time. And uh, Richard Leakey introduced me to Frank Brown, and he recommended that I become uh, his uh, geology student. And that's how my university education started. And then I, was, um, I came to University of Utah, and I was Frank Brown's student for both my bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Everything was under Frank Brown. And I remember, when I was going to get an interview to at the US Embassy, it was extremely very difficult to get a visa at that time. And I got a recommendation letter uh, by, by Richard. When I took it to the, to the embassy for interview, I think that my, my interview was the shortest one of all the people that we went there. So they just looked, read the letter, and they told me, come in the afternoon and get your visa. So, so, so this is a very, uh, a very important talk for me because uh, it's, it's really a reflection of um, the, the fruits and the, what, what Richard really wanted to happen with me train, being trained as a geologist and continuing with the work that uh, Frank was doing. So and there are several organizations and people who have contributed uh, towards my, my studies uh, through either scholarship or funding to go to the field. And uh, they include uh, some of these institutions that are listed here and many other people. So I always start with uh, acknowledgement because sometimes I, I talk too much and I don't have time to, to acknowledge. So and my talk will be about uh, uh, the physical stratigraphic dating method. So it's basically using field observation and then uh, to, 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 to refine and then uh, uh, relate various events, geologic events that happen in the field for you to be able to come up with a, with a, with a date of a, of a site. And then these uh, geological events include both the deposition of volcanic and uh, tectonic and I'll be focusing a lot on tectonics and, um, and, and volcanic. So the geologic framework of the Tukana Basin is one of the best uh, uh, in, that part, in that part of the world, in, uh, particularly for the Pliocene and Pleistocene. And that is because of the presence of a lot of volcanic ashes that are associated with pumices where you can be able to get uh, uh, feldspar crystals and date them and then link those ashes uh, with, with glasses that you can use for geochemical correlation and stratigraphy. So, and for that reason, people ask, you know, why would you have any uh, geochronology uh, problem in the Chukana when you have such a very, very well refined uh, stratigraphy that is mostly using uh, tephra material, and then you can also refine that using um, uh, paleomag and uh, some, some other methods. 
So, and because of the work that has been done there, uh, identifying various volcanic ashes, these uh, uh, graph here show the distribution of all the eruptions that have been happening in the Tukana Basin for the last uh, uh, four million years. And this is just uh, based on the ashes that have been able to be correlated. So we have almost uh, 400 uh, eruptions of volcanic ashes uh, within the Tukana Basin. So that gives us a very, very well-refined uh, uh, stratigraphy uh, within the Tukana Basin. But there are some occasions where you are not going to be able to find these volcanic ashes or anything that you can obtain uh, absolute dates. And, and often you'll find your section having faults all over. And that's where you have to devise a method that you can be able to use in order to uh, tie your isolated outcrop to another uh, area where you can be able to obtain uh, good uh, dates. So, and that's what I'll be discussing. And uh, there are so many sites that have this kind of uh, scenario. So, and it happens that um, Frank Brown was a petrologist. And one of the methods that he developed for, for identifying volcanic ashes was first of all to be able to sort, because they get mixed as they're traveling from the sites of eruption to, to where they're deposited. So, and it happens that these volcanic ashes also get mixed together with sediments. So the method that I've been using, which was initially proposed by Frank, is looking at the sediments that come together with the volcanic ashes, okay? And trying also to find some bath marks that you can be able to identify within those grains, whether it's quartz grains or feldspar, okay? And it's a method that has been used very effectively in the oil and gas. Um, it happens that I've worked in the oil and gas for quite a while, since 2006. So I know they use this method very effectively. And I, I, Frank said, you know, why, why can't, you, can't we be able to develop such a method so that we can use it together with uh, the absolute dating method within the Tukana Basin? So, so he, has, he collected at least uh, you know, uh, 3,000 samples of volcanic ashes that have also detrator grain with them. So that's what we were working with, and most, most of them were from the Tukana Basin. But the challenge with this is that you require a lot of money to be able to carry out such a study. And, and for geology, it can become very tricky to be able to obtain funding to do this. So, and, um, so I'll, I'll give an example of the application of this that I was able to do uh, in the oil and gas uh, uh, using the petrology method. And we have proved that it can be able to work there, so there's no reason that it should not be able to work in the Tukana Basin. So in, in the next few slides, I'm going to show that. So, so for you to be able to use the petrology method, you have to be able to identify uh, where the sediments are coming from. So, so for example, this is the drainage basin of the Tukana Basin. So you have to know like, the characteristics of the this quartz or sediments that are coming from that part of the basin and the other ones that are coming from these other parts of the basin. And that way, when you find them in a fluvial deposit, you can be able to link them to their source. So, so that's one of the, the important things to be able to know. And the sediments are going to be coming from different sources, either metamorphic rocks or igneous rocks, and from very, very different age. Uh, age groups. And depending on the environment in which they are formed, uh, either quartz or feldspar or other minerals, they'll have some distinct characteristic that will be a reflection of the source, of their sources. So, so, and in addition to that, you know, they might even be coming from basalts that are coming from different age intervals. But even with that, you can still be able to use the petrology method to identify uh, class that are coming from different type of basalts. And one of the examples that I'll show you here, uh, show how that uh, could also be very effective. So whether you have sandstones or conglomerates, you can, or pebbles, you can still be able to use the method uh, for that. So, so one of the studies, uh, when I was uh, finishing my PhD, I was sent for internship to work in the oil and gas industry. 
And I had an opportunity uh, to, to, to do a study that was using petrology. So within five years, I had a um, uh, sample collection of about 100,000 uh, samples, petrology samples, all coming from all over the world, ranging in age from Ordovician up to, up to present, and from very different environments. And the objective was to see whether you can be able to, what you can be able to tell about the deposition environment and so many things concerning uh, reservoir. So this was in the oil and gas reservoir. So this is what I was able to come up with. So, so these are the section uh, images. So the colors here are a reflection of the electrophages that are, they are getting from the basin. So you can actually see that each distinct, distinctive color that they're getting from, uh, from the, the basin has a very unique petrology characteristic. So the petrology is giving you the face of the fishes that you're having there. And you can actually even be able to know the deposition environment because some of these uh, uh, sediments, uh, they have uh, fossils. And you can even be able to the, know the diagenetic transformation. Uh, so there's a lot of information that you would be able to know just from petrology. So, so, so that includes the, the original deposition of fishes and then the deposition and uh, the, the, the diagenesis that has happened over time. And from that, uh, electrophages, which is based on logs that are drilled into, into the wells, you can be able to also link it with uh, seismic data. Okay? And once you link it with seismic data, you can uh, be able to extrapolate and take it uh, to other parts of the basin. And, uh, and seismic data will help you to be able to identify where faults are occurring and where these, uh, these break in the, in, the, in the beds. And then you can also link that to a sequence stratigraphic model. And that would really cover the whole basin that you have. So this method is very effective in the oil and gas, and petrology, for that reason, became a very, very important tool, especially for unconventional reservoirs here in the US, uh, because you can be able to tell a lot, even just from the microscopic uh, features. So, and this is the example that proved to me and to Frank that you can be able to use this method and to, to, to do such studies in the Tucana Basin. So the first application of a physical stratigraphic dating method, we used it to refine the age of this basalt here uh, that used to, to have different name depending on where you are. So for example, here it was called uh, the Cataboy. At Lothagam, it was the Lothagam basalt, and then you'll have another area it's called the, 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 the Kokoi. And it had different isotropic ages that they had, uh, they had for it, ranging all the way from 3 point, maybe 3.8, all the way to almost uh, 9 million years. So, and around 2004, when I was uh, doing my, my master's, uh, uh, my bachelor's degree, Frank took me to one of the sites. And in that site, uh, we saw there was a shell bed. And the reason he took me to that site is because he thought it was unique because the, the shell beds were capping on uh, basalts. But what we discovered is that there is actually a chilled contact between the basalts and the shell bed. And we went to very many locations within the basin and we saw the same relationship. So this showed to us, uh, demonstrated to us that the basalt was actually intruding into a lake. So, and we were able to confine the, 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 the age of that basalt to the age of, of the occurrence of that lake. And when you look at the petrology of that basalt, the mineralogy is basically identical. The, the, the texture, the fabric of the minerals, identical. So for that reason, we were able to assign that basalt uh, to about four million years. And even though, for example, in this area, it looks as if it's overlying, like lake sediments, we see a lot of areas where the dikes were actually intruding uh, the lake sediments. So the basalt spread uh, throughout the basin, and it was associated actually with some tectonic events that was ha were happening in the basin. 
So, and after seeing that, we, we wanted to go to some other areas there. We also have basalts uh, deposited there, and that area is Leongalani. We saw the same thing. There were several basalts that were, were erupting, and in between them are sediments. And every time you see those basalts, you would see a lake sequence developing. So all these basalts were intruding uh, lake sequences. And the, what that told us, that this specific deposition environment that is associated with the eruption of basalt, and most of these basalt were associated also with faulting. So there are three things that are happening. This faulting that is happening, uh, eruption of basalt almost at the same time as the time the, the lake are forming. So if you can be able to identify those markers, because they'll be uh, um, evident throughout the basin, then it will be easy for you to know what time interval that you're dealing with, because it's a, it will be associated with a specific deposition environment. Either lacustrine or you, see, you will see a major erosion uh, uh, taking place around there. So, so, so we saw that the association is occurring throughout during uh, the, plus, the, the, the Pliocene. And because it's a major thing that is happening within the basin, if you can be able to identify that uh, stratigraphic marker as an erosion surface or disconformity, then you would be able to know what uh, the, the age range that you're dealing with, okay? So, and this is the, the occurrence of, uh, of that Loyangalani section. And you see when the, where the intensity of basalt vol volcanism is occurring there, that's where you have the biggest uh, gap in the, in the sediments, the sediment occurrence within the Kubifora formation. So it means that the, the position within the, the Trukana Basin, at least during Pliocene, was very much affected by, by volcanic activities that were happening. So if you can be able to identify that horizon, even if you don't have uh, volcanic ashes or other things, then you would be able to use it as a stratigraphic marker. And that is one of the, 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 the phenomena that we're using for dating, uh, uh, finding uh, precise ages for some of these sites, uh, including uh, uh, South Tarkwood and other places where you have uh, isolated outcrop that don't have volcanic ashes. So, and with that, we were also able to, to, to reconstruct the distribution of the basin within uh, sediments within the basin and know uh, that uh, there, there, are a lot of out, there are a lot of sediments within the basin. And if you can be able to know where you have uh, faulting taking place and bringing up those sediments, then it would be easy for you to be able to find uh, um, outcrops or sediments. And uh, I'm running out of time here. So, so once you understand this association between faulting, basalt volcanism, and deposition environment, it will be easy for you to, to even be able to find a new outcrop. Because one of the common things between these Miocene deposits and the, and the South Tarkwell Paleocene deposits and some of these Oligocene deposits is a big fault that is growing, going through. And it started being active all the way from Pliocene, for, from Miocene, mid-Miocene, and when you go to South Sackville, you can actually see it being active almost about 3.7, uh, 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 3.5 million years. So that means that if you walk around there, it's, you're very likely to find uh, some, some sections of deposition that are, are going to be cropping out. So I'll, uh, I'll go quite fast here. So, and we can be able to use the same technique to understand what was happening in the basin uh, in terms of deposition by taking advantage of cuttings uh, uh, and using petrology to, to reconstruct uh, the, the deposition environment within the Chukana uh, Basin. And this has been a very effective method uh, in the oil and gas. So we can basically be able to use that. And one of the studies that I did here for, for the oil and gas is to take a, a section here, the vertical section, and cuttings from the horizontal, and basically reconstruct how the fishes uh, are developing along the, the stratigraphic units, and even know where the faults are occurring, okay, just by using cuttings. So it's a similar thing that we would be able to do uh, within the, the Trukana Basin, because we have a lot of wells from the oil and gas and data that we can be able to use uh, for reconstruction of that. And, and this is just uh, an example of how you can be able to use petrology to know how the, 
how some of those uh, fishes are occurring. So, so for conclusion, so, so petrology will be able to help you relate and then uh, know the timing of various uh, events, whether they are basalt volcanism or tectonic. And if you can tie those uh, events with a date that you know elsewhere, then you don't even need to know the, uh, to have a direct uh, isotopic measurements there. You will use that relative date as the approximate date for, for, those, for that interval. So, uh, so and there are, there are many other applications that you can be able to use for, for this, which includes, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, even for economic use, uh, geothermal, uh, and, and finding many other resources just based on uh, petrology. So and the good thing about that is that you will be able to, uh, to get resources even from other people working in the basin, including the oil and gas companies that are working there, and we could use some of their data to really uh, being, be able to reconstruct uh, the geology of the Tukana Basin. And uh, so I think that's the last slide because I've uh, gone over time. <laughs> <laughs>